Welcome to the October 2021 edition of The Bench Report. Today I'm here at my piano at my place. This is a, a short baby grand piano per, uh, made by the Howard Company, which is a division of the Baldwin Piano Company. And I will be presenting about the music that I'm going to be playing tomorrow at my mom's house. Um, there, the piano there is the one I grew up on. It's a George Steck upright uh, spinet type of piano produced um, that company is in London um, and and there's an American branch or there was an American branch in Chicago um, that is the piano that I grew up playing on I started playing when I was eight years old only because my one of my cousins was doing it she quit six months later and my mom said no you have to keep going we didn't move this piano up from your grandpa's house for nothing so Anyway, here I am, however many years later. Um, so, so I will be playing on her piano tomorrow. It's a lighter action than what you would find on a baby grand action. That particular piano is an upright instrument, and it's got the it's got the type of light action that you would typically find on a domestic piano. Domestic meaning something you would find in somebody's house. So, and the music that I'm playing on that piano tomorrow is a set of sonatinas written by Muzio Clementi. Uh, he was an Italian composer. He worked in the in the classical era, um, and he but he worked most of his professional career in London. So, the three main components in today's talk. First is talking a little bit about the classical era itself, its features, its qualities, its characteristics. Um, and then second is the piano as an instrument, a little bit about the development and the use of it as it was in its developmental stages. And then the third topic will be Clementi, the composer himself and, and his music, how he used it and, and how it was used and such. Okay, first thing is the classical era. When you look at a simple timeline of Western music history where the different historical periods are marked, the classical era holds what seems to be a very short period of time. This being from the year 1750, which happened to be the death date of the great Johann Sebastian Bach, to the year 1800, that's only a mere 50 years. That is fairly short compared to the previous historical period, the Baroque era, which has been assigned 150 years, dates 1600 to 1750, by the musicological canon. Musicological canon being, being music historians that have come up with these historical periods and have somehow decided on what what works for defining these periods. So how does something like this happen? How do we get a very, what seems to be a very short period of music history after a very long period of music history? For one thing in general, the lines be between historical periods and their styles are always ambiguous anyway, as the styles of the newer, the newer periods always seem to creep up a little bit before the end of a previous period. They get developed by composers, and then at some point that becomes kind of the main, main those new styles become the main um, styles of what becomes a new period in music history. And of course, in with the new, out goes the old. So, <clears throat> so for example, somebody starts a new trend takes a while for it to catch on, and eventually does, but maybe the old style is still trying to hang on in nearby social circles. This is pretty much what happened at the end of the Baroque era on many levels, not just the music, but the other arts too, and add to that other aspects of society at the time, such as philosophy for one. I have a great quote, I'll, I'll be reading about that in a moment and political changes. For example, the Holy Roman Empire, which had existed since around the year 1000, it had, in the, in the, 
in the early 1700s, it had just started its last hundred years of existence. And really, it had been dis dissolving for some time, its power and its affix over, over Western Europe. But the last hundred years was really crucial. That's where the dissolution really starts to, to crumble pretty good. And then, of course, it's, the end is really marked by the, the Napoleonic Wars in the very early 1800s. So that's one example right there. Then you have, in addition to politi the political changes, you, you see the power of various religious institutions starting to change. And also economic conditions start to change. And, and with that, with a to partially to go with the philosophical side, you get other innovations in businesses, industry, and so many other um, facets of, of life. And so all of that kind of melds together and it creates a new kind of energy, so to speak, which uh, which then leads to some new ways of doing things. So, so I had mentioned about philosophy in particular. I'm gonna find it here. around. Anyway, so with the early 18th century, that's the early 1700s, start to have a lot of new philosophical thought coming around. People like, people like Immanuel Kant, Percy's, also have Voltaire. There's a great quote I had by Voltaire. Find it here. I may have to come back to it. I think I will. So, anyway, so getting on with classical style, what you had before in the Baroque was a very kind of high art, complicated, sophisticated system of polyphony in which you had various melodic lines weaving back and forth and over and across each other. And for an average listener, it made it very difficult to to cut to lip to just sit and listen and really kind of know what is going on um what ends up happening is at some point in different in business innovations in in the world at that time is the middle class starts to grow the the transfer of wealth and power starts to happen from the upper echelon, the very few, the aristocracy, the, the courts, the people, and, and even, even the upper religious, um, all that wealth starts to kind of come down into the middle class. And so the middle class, people in the middle class, start to become interested in, in the arts. And, but without any kind of understanding of how any of this stuff works, works, what they start to ask for from composers and musicians is something a little simpler, something a little more understandable for those who aren't trained um, in the upper arts of music, for example. And so you get a much simpler style in the classical era. Um, Melodic lines are simpler, they're easier to understand, the coveting textures are much lighter, and, um, and so, so, that, so that ushers in some changes in how music is created. Um, with that, um, the instruments that were used at the time um, had some limitations. So, for example, in keyboard instruments, which is my area of focus, um, the predominant keyboard instrument other than the organ in the Baroque era would have been the harpsichord and the clavichord. They function slightly differently, but they both have, they're both 
have the same type of keyboard. And I will demonstrate what they sound like, what one of them sounds like here in a moment. But they're limited in their expressive qualities. Um, for example, the, what we get in the modern day piano is a great difference between loud and soft. hear the difference there I just I played four notes alternating be between loud and soft and well the harpsichord you couldn't really do that it wasn't built to do that um, it was a much lighter instrument anyway but because it was a plucked instrument and not plucked by fingers like a guitar or lute would be but um, plucked by a key a key mechanism, which after so many different points of point, points of, of um, where, where everything has to move around to um, eventually strike the strike strike the string, um, the the ability to play a louder sound on just a particular note is very limited. And actually with a harpsichord, the strings on the harpsichord were not, were not struck anyway. They were plucked. It's a huge difference. So I'm going to move the, the camera around so you can see what a harpsichord looks like. Uh, I placed it kind of a mess. So this is going to be an interesting experiment in trying to move this around. Here we go. All right, so here you can see a full-length harpsichord. I'm going to raise it against above the stand here a moment. And you'll see that there are two manuals, two keyboard manuals on here. And, and then behind that, you have, just like you would on a piano, you have a set of strings that go out from the keyboard mechanism, which is going to be back that way. And they come out. And of course, the longer strings are for the, are for the, the, the lower notes. The higher strings, or the shorter strings, excuse me, are for the higher notes. So, and I'm going to go ahead and take the music stand, music desk, off of the harpsichord for a moment. I'll just briefly show you how this is constructed. All right, so with the harpsichord, like I said, we've got two manuals. Um, harpsichords could have either one or two manuals, just depended on um, what the use of the instrument was, and also probably the economic status of the buyer. If you had more money, you were probably going to have a more sophisticated looking instrument, such as this one. And of course, you're probably going to have two manuals because you, you could do more with it. Um, now, now, the keys are very similar on a harpsichord to the piano, just that the colors are inverted. Um, it's a very light touch, and because the strings are plucked, oops, what did I do here? Ha! I'm going to take this, block, this off. All right. When a string is plucked on a harpsichord, let's see if we can find which one this one is. There we go. All right, I'm on, I just played middle C there. And when, when the note is played, what it does is the lever that goes from the key underneath, you can't see it in here, of course. And then that lever on the back end, kind of like a seesaw, comes up, and it kicks up the jack. This piece is called a jack. You see it, the pin at the bottom. And then the most important piece about this 
it's hard to see it on here, but right about where you see that red piece of felt, there is a tiny, tiny plastic piece here. It's called a plectra. And that strikes the string. Let me see if I can... Um, there you go. It's that kind of darker, straight line looking thing. Anyway, that's the plectra. And what it does... I'm going to put it back in. Very carefully, of course. Not being able to see where all the holes are inside, you kind of have to guess where, to, <laughs> where this... There we go. Okay, let's plug back in. So when you strike the string, that plectra, it plucks the string as it comes up. And then because of how the action is, instead of replucking the string as it goes back down, there is kind of a joint on here that allows that pushes that part of the jack back in so then it doesn't repluck the string and then to stop the sound that red felt piece ah, trying to get this back in that red felt piece dampens the string so you pluck it with the plectra and then when you release the key, that that goes back down, and then the damper dampens <laughs> the string. It keeps it stops the sound creation. It stops the string from vibrating, which is what creates the sound or keeps the sound going. So that's how that works. That's how the harpsichord works. The clavichord, the other early instrument, it has hammered strings, but so it works just a little bit differently. The main action is very similar, where you know, you press a key and that activates a lever system inside. And then and then somewhere it strikes the string and creates sound. I don't have one of those. Someday maybe I'll get one. But for now, this is what I've got. So, so that's kind of how the harp works. I've got to get this back on the stand. Now the main problem with the harpsichord is that ushered in the need for a different type of instrument is is in the creation of loud and soft, soft sounds. So, with a piano, if you strike the key with greater force, it'll create a louder sound. If you strike the key on a harpsichord with greater force, you're gonna get a bunch of noise. So, and you're gonna get the same volume regardless. Something going on back there. No, it's okay. So, <clears throat> so anyway, so what you had to do as a harpsichordist in order to create the illusion of loud and soft sounds was you had to use other other finger techniques. For example, putting space in between in between notes, to, um, which then when you have a space in between a note, that whatever note you play after that space is going to momentarily seem just a little bit louder. Um, now, other things you could do with a harpsichord to give it a louder sound in general is you could, if you had two manuals or two sets of strings, or maybe even three sets of strings, you could couple them together, meaning which would involve moving some sort of lever system on the instrument, depending how it was built, and then you get both, both sets of strings playing together on whether it's just one note that you're playing or the whole thing. Big chord, such as that. Pop that back in. So, so, and, so one of the things that musicians wanted to do in the classical period, 
they wanted to be able to do was they wanted to have greater control of expression in music. And I'm going to put this back over here. And in order to do that, they needed to have more control of dynamics on a on an individual note level, which you couldn't really have before on the harpsichord or the clavichord. The clavichord did have a little bit of an ability to, to play a little louder, but it was so, so minute and so, so limited. They, it was very, very subtle anyway. And of course the, that particular instrument in general was a very quiet instrument. So you weren't going to be playing it in a very big space anyway. It was going to be played in just a very small space. Um, at biggest, maybe the size of this room, for example, because the sound just didn't carry. I'm going to get back over to the, to the bench now. So, <clears throat> so with, with, with the classical style, you get a lot of more... You get more variety and nuance in your music. You get louder sounds within even a few notes. Whether you want to go louder or softer. And of course, with the piano, um, with the development of the piano, you also have a change in technical demands as well. Um, by virtue of how piano was constructed. The first documented piano is credited to, to be um, made by, by Bartolomeo Cristofori, who's the keeper of the instruments in the Florentine courts. And the date of that document is around the year 1700, um, which means he was experimenting with creating a piano type of instrument even before that. Um, some historical sources are saying perhaps about 10, 15 years before that, um, but those are just kind of guesses, educated guesses uh, based on what his instruments were like and of course archival research um, which would look at the notes he had on his instruments and that sort of thing. Uh, so then the piano, the big difference in the piano is we have a hammered string. Gotta get the camera again show you how that works a little bit. Won't take as long. All right. So, let me get some of that stuff out of the way here. All right, so, when you strike a string on the piano, again, you have a similar lever action inside from the key. Whoop. Going back from the key to ultimately the hammer, which then... Now that's a damper that you see. The actual hammer is down below the strings. Okay. My device wants me to rotate this and I'm not going to do that. So if you look below the strings, you can see some other type of white, thick white line um, going crossways. Those are hammers, or that's that, those are the, the extensions that go to the hammers. The hammers are actually underneath the strings, which are underneath the dampers, so you can't see the hammers very well. But but what goes, what connects to the hammers is just right under there, so you can see where where they come up as I press the key. And then they strike the string underneath. And then, of course, if I keep that key depressed, the sound keeps on, keeps on going. And then when I let the key down, there's another piece of action that then activates the dampers here and lets that fall, which then silences the strings. So <clears throat> I'm going to put this back on the stand. All right. So, and of course, with the invention of the piano, 
Um, it took, took a long time for different piano builders um, to kind of to experiment with how all this was going to work. And if you look into a detailed history of the piano, you'll see that uh, many different piano builders were experimenting with different types of actions in order to make the, the hammers strike the strings. Um, and then, of course, the other thing that had to happen was they had to figure out how to dampen the sounds so that the, the strings would not continue vibrating and, the, and thus the sound could be stopped. So, <clears throat> so, so with that, <clears throat> I'm going to move on to Clementi. Like I said, he was a composer of the classical era. And he was born in Italy. His, his dates are 1752. So he was born actually towards the end of the classical era. And he died in 1832. Um, but the style of music that he composed was greatly influenced by what was going on throughout the classical era. And then, of course, as a pianist, he was particularly interested in how to play the piano properly with the piano being a relatively new instrument uh, quite a few composers were interested in how to properly develop piano techniques so that you could have a good clean playing style and many treatises were written on on that subject uh, clementi himself wrote a wrote a treatise and had numerous um, exercise books on how on how a person could develop their their piano technique. Um, of course, the piano back then was still very light, so the and the type of music that was that was composed back then was a very light nature too, not nearly as heavy and dark as the music that comes later on in the Romantic era and and beyond that. But <clears throat> so. <clears throat> He was recognized early on for his music talents when he was a youngster, and he ended up he ended up um, being employed by going to school and then being tutored and being employed by by people in in London, England. Um, it's kind of interesting because a lot of Italian composers at that point were not really working in Italy so much. At the time, the musical center was in Vienna. And um, so a lot of a lot of musicians were were moving up to the Austria area. Germany was another important place as well. France was a very important place musically as well, although they had their own different style and England with the massive the massive wealth in in that country um, they became more interested in becoming a cultural center so they were employing a lot of musicians from around the continent as well so Clementi was one of those he spent most of his life in London um, he did travel quite a bit, like so many other musicians did, but um, let's see. And mostly he was known for his compositions for the piano. And um, he had quite a few, quite, quite a few sets of compositions for the piano, some written ex explicitly as sets, we think. Um, and some not, just depending on who was asking for, for the music. Uh, what we have available to us today in the form of publications, um, most, of, most of that is going to be his sets of sonatinas and sonatas. There are other works available, but generally you're not going to find them at in your local music store. You're gonna find them in a collected sets and monuments edition at a university library, that type of a place. Or if you're a music nut like me, you might have 
copies of those that you mm, <clears throat> that, that, that you just kind of you know came about in different ways but so um, his sonatinas the style of his sonatinas follow a very strict classical style um, form wise uh, the binary form is probably the most prolific form of the classical style. Um, binary meaning it's two parts. Um, now, of course, sonatinas, by definition, they are a small sonata. Now, if you've, if you've seen me play some other sonatas by in other recordings, I've done several, I've done a couple by Ludwig von Beethoven, who was a later classical era composer late and early romantic. Um, those sonatas are in multiple movements, three or four. Well, the son sonatinas are in three or four movements as well, but each movement typically carries a binary form. Um, and of course, form in the classical period is very dependent on what had become a new a, a new way of um, a new a new way of of categorizing harmonic function and um, so typically what happens in in uh, in a binary form gotta grab my music is you start with whatever key your piece is in. I'm just gonna use the first one as an example. This one starts in C major. And then at some point, shortly after that, because this one happens to be really short, it ends up in a different key. We start in C and we end in the key of G major. So I'll just play this one little part as an example. So very quickly we ended in the key of G, even though we started in the key of C. Um, and then, of course, the second part of that binary form will usually start wherever you left off. In this case, the key of G major. And then eventually it'll make it way, its way back to the original key, B of C. key to end that, that second part of the binary structure. So that is a very typical form of, of the classical era um, that's used over and over again. Uh, the rondo is also another form uh, that's used and it and in its in its in its inception it's still a fairly simple form of the classical era. Um, it's not nearly as complex as the rondos get later on in the, in the romantic eras, but, um, and, and then of course there are other forms as well, but, so, um, let's see here. I don't think there was anything else I wanted to mention. I did say that Clementi had, had written, had written a treatise on the, on piano playing and he did have several instruction not instruction books but etude type of books which are just technical studies really um he did have several of those um the one that's most well known is the gratis ad parnassum um, which gets progressively more and more difficult as you go along and actually this particular set of sonatinas 
um, kind of follows the same path. It starts with very simple style at the beginning, and then as you get to the to, as you get to the fifth or sixth, then you've got a little bit more difficult uh, technique that's required. Um, and this particular edition that I'll be playing from tomorrow is actually a teaching edition um, published by the Alfred Publishing Company. This is a very old one. I've had this since, I don't know what year, 1980. I thought I had a date on here somewhere. Maybe not. I'm guessing mm, mid, late 1980s. It's in pretty good shape actually for being that old. Although the cover's fallen off and a few pages have gone flying here from here a couple times and I've had to retape them in. But, um, but this particular edition, I mentioned it's a teaching edition and inside it's it's got some words from the editor about Khomeini style, but also, let's see if this works, he, take, he gives a page where it shows um, Clementi's instructions for playing ornaments on the piano, how they're to be played, and of course, Clemente's original publication is going to look a little different from this because the typeset is way different. But, but you can see how, how this is set up in modern notation. Modern me, meaning 20th century typeface. And so, and then the other thing, my bad. The other thing is, let me switch that around. If I can figure out how to do it. That was the first time I've done this. Anyway, I'm going to switch this around the other way. This will have to work for a moment. We're almost done anyway. So the other thing is that in a teaching edition, the editor is going to have a lot of grade print, which gives suggestions as to fingerings and dynamic nuance and, and the like. Um, so like, for example, I'm looking at this backwards, right here you see a grade slur line. So that's just an editorial suggestion um, down further below where you see all these numbers you have original fingering suggested by Clementi in the black like the three and the one here and then you have suggested fingerings by the editor in gray and in parentheses the four and the two in those two spots so I'm going to be playing from this one tomorrow and, and of course I do have another edition. I have an, an edition that is just, just, it's just a modern type, typeface set of the original. Um, but I haven't actually played with that one and of course that particular edition all of the print is really tight, so it's very difficult to read anyway. Um, so, so I'm going to be using this this one instead. So, I think that's it for today. So, hope you enjoyed that. Hope that was somewhat informational. You can always look up. Um, there's lots of great resources on the internet for for learning about all this stuff. Um, like I said earlier. There's one, there's lots of resources for piano development and how, how, how they're built inside. It's very, uh, it's pretty technically complicated how all that stuff is put together. There's no way I could ever put that together in a video, mostly because I'm not a piano technician anyway, but it's just very involved. And of course, um, there's a lot 
a lot of details about classical style and um, the different composers. Um, Mozart was, prop as far as keyboard literature, he's one of the more popular, well-known composers of, key of keyboard literature from the classical era. era. Of course, he was well-known for lots of other kinds of music too, other instruments and opera and, and symphonies and such. And um, also another name I should throw out there for, um, for keyboard music would be Domenico Scarlatti. Um, also an Italian, he worked in Spain um, and, and his, his music is, is, a lot of his is used for teaching, but also used for some performance as well. So that's it. We'll see you tomorrow when I play the Clementi over at mom and dad's house.